Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and you are an important part of our EWTN family. And we're delighted that you've welcomed us into your home. We want to hear from you. So send us an email with your question or your comment to Jim and Joy at EWTN. Dot com. And today we are truly honored to have Captain Guy Gruders with us today. He is a Vietnam prisoner of war and he's an author and he's going to be here today telling us his story. You could go to his website. It's GuyGruders.net. Yeah, Joy, we had such a beautiful Memorial Day show yes. with you all there. I heard from so many of you uh, appreciating our military people, sharing stories of those who paid the ultimate price and how we should respect them and military families. And we want to continue that theme with Captain Guy Gruders today, uh, affirming our military people, affirming the sacrifice that their families make to support their loved ones in the military service, and that we as a nation affirm the sacrifices that they make. Yeah, and you know, it is wonderful that he's here to tell his story. Mm -hmm. Because you know, if we don't know our history, yeah. uh, uh, how are <clears throat> we going to learn? How are we going to know and celebrate our freedom as freedoms can be taken away from yeah. us, as we are just seeing in our nation and the attack well, on our freedoms as they are? The thing with Guy Gruder is, is that he tells not only his story, right. but he speaks about other POWs and mm -hmm. military people, and he tells the story of families, the heroic love of families. So it's, it's very broad and very deep, and the great story of faith. Yes. Well, we have a phone call today. We have a guest <coughs> who's going to be on, and his name is Hank Stickley. Now, Hank is the son of the late First Lieutenant Harry Stickley, who was awarded the Silver Star for gallantry in action on February 14th, 1945, as a pilot of the B-52, it was, right? B-24-type uh, aircraft. And so Hank is going to tell us he was the shot, story. He was yes. shot down. Uh, it was on February 14th, 1945, World War II, and he was, uh, he's a U.S. Army uh, air, air person, uh, pilot. So, Hank, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy, brother. Please share with us. Hi, Jim and Joy. Great to talk to you. Hope you're doing well. We, we are. are. Thank God. Well, thanks for the opportunity to share. I've seen Captain Gruder's incredible moving homecoming video. Yeah after five years as a prisoner of war in a, in a brutal camp. And I watched a speech he gave recently, a couple years ago, to a Catholic men's conference. So I just want to thank Captain Gruder for his you know, great and heroic service to our country in Vietnam, and as well as his service to the church today. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. But just to share for a minute about my dad, as you mentioned, uh, thanks for that opportunity. Um, Harry Stickley, as you mentioned, was in World War II as a lieutenant and was um, on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1945. He was piloting a B-24, a big airplane with four engines and flying over a, a Nazi uh, installation in Austria. His plane hit, was hit by an 88 millimeter shell, which destroyed a good portion of the cockpit as well as all the important instruments he needed to, to fly the plane. The co-pilot was also injured and had to be removed from the cockpit. So he was pretty much on his own trying to keep it under control. Yeah. Now, just what the, you know, what the official Army document said was that um, although wounded and bleeding profusely, Lieutenant Stickley managed to avoid collision, mm. control the stricken bomber by use of various instruments that weren't destroyed. And despite his wounds and being partially blinded by flying glass and the mm. temperatures were under zero because it's so cold up there, he managed to stay at the controls for two hours, mm. brought the plane in over an emergency field in friendly territory, but he wasn't there yet. And then while on his landing, all four engines stopped working. Mm. Uh, but he was able to make an amazing crash landing in a valley without any injury to his crew of nine nine men. So all the men were rescued and returned home safely. So as a result, my dad was awarded the Silver Star, which is one of the <clears throat> highest um, medals that can be awarded, as well as the Purple Heart for his wounds received. So Beautiful. Just, it just brought to mind on this Memorial Day, 
I'm thankful for those brave men and women who did not make it home safely yes. and who gave the ultimate sacrifice for our, for us, for our country, and for our freedom. Hank, uh, thank you. For the chance to share that. Thank you thank for you, sharing so you. proudly and so beautifully about your dad. And a shout out to your precious mother, yeah. Catherine. Catherine, thank you for your sacrifice. There's plenty more to come here on At Home with Jim and Joy. We're honoring uh, our, our veterans, those who pay the ultimate price as well. We have Guy Garudas with us, a prisoner of war during the Vietnam uh, War. And there's plenty more to come. We'll be right back. Please don't go away. back where you are at home with Jim and Joy. And today, what an honor to bring to you Captain Amen. Guy Gruders. He's a Vietnam prisoner of war for five years. He's an author. You could go to his great website, guygruders.net. And you want to go to his website so you can see his amazing story and the great sacrifice that he paid for our country, for yeah. your freedom and for mine. And for that, we are extremely grateful. Yeah, when we first met him in the back, I was going through his information and I, I thought, you can't say quickly mm. a prisoner of war for over five years. You know, I, I said it the first time I said, wait, let me say that let again. Let me say that slowly, you know, you Because uh, thanks mm. for going through my life in 30 seconds, you know, mm -hmm. and that's not your life. You have a life that's even larger than that, praise be to the Lord. So Guy, just tell us a little bit about yourself and your family and then we'll go into your story. Sandy and I had two children when I went to Vietnam, volunteered for Vietnam, and I was shot down two times, had 400 combat missions supporting the U.S. Army 173rd Airborne Brigade, and then as a fighter pilot shot down in North Vietnam, captured, spent five years and, as a prisoner. So about six years plus, just mm -hmm. a little over six years in Vietnam, came back, Sandy waited faithfully for me all that time, mm -hmm. and we had five more children, mm -hmm. sweetheart, Three girls in their 40s couldn't have children because mm -hmm. of probably because of the terrible prison diet for the first few years, but mm -hmm. she still had mm -hmm. five more children. So mm -hmm. we've had plus three late term miscarriages. Mm -hmm. So we had seven children all together and we've had uh, 18 grandchildren. But you. she's my hero. Yes. Yeah. Now, when you were, did she know that you were a prisoner or that you were alive? She, did she know that you were alive? She didn't know that I was alive. Mm -hmm. I did have a, the greatest, probably one of the greatest fighter pilots ever, mm -hmm. who I was flying with. He was my instructor mm -hmm. when I was shot down. And when he was shot down, uh, he w had to take, there was a position of 36 guns that we were attacking, mm -hmm. and the 36 guns hit us. Mm -hmm. So we ejected, were captured. The next day after capture, he was taken to all 36 gun sites for a cheer by the gun crews, mm -hmm. which were about 10 mm -hmm. soldiers each. So he spent all day walking from gun site to gun site, he listening to these cheers. On the way back home, the guard was playing with his survival radio, mm -hmm. an emergency radio, and he put it on transmit by mistake. Mm -hmm. And one of our men that was up looking for us heard it, heard mm -hmm. the beeper, yeah. and said, I got you, Misty's. Where are you? Mm -hmm. And this guy didn't know what he was doing, but the guy was with us, an extremely cool head. Mm -hmm. And he said, here, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. And he got a hold of the survival radio from the guard. Mm -hmm. So for the only time in North Vietnam, 3,500 people shot down. Mm -hmm. The guy I was with got a hold of a survival radio after capture mm -hmm. and told him that he and I were alive mm -hmm. and would see her at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. But that was just, he was just saying that. He didn't know that and Sandy didn't know it. But it was some hope, but they wouldn't let us write for about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. After two and a half years, we were allowed to tell our family that we were alive. At that time, there was 300 alive out of 2,100. The Russians and the North Vietnamese tortured to death or killed in one way or another six out of seven American mm -hmm. aircrew that were shot down in mm -hmm. North Vietnam. Um, it, it seems like, uh, reading your story, 
that you were shot down twice, but it seems like they were close. They like were, you were shot I down was one shot down two out of three mm -hmm. uh, missions. Mm -hmm. I was shot down. I went to the hospital. I had a shattered wrist. For 10 so days, and then you went 10 back. 10 days, then I had to have a cast, uh, cast on for, uh, you know, a couple yeah. months, but I cut the cast off, literally. Of course. <laughs> and was flying a little bit early, mm -hmm. which saved my life because they didn't put my gun, my uh, pistol, back in my harness because mm -hmm. they were still cleaning it from the salt water landing of the first time. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a gun when the 10 soldiers found me. Mm -hmm. If I would tried to shoot it out, mm -hmm. yeah. I would be dead. I never would have made it. Mm -hmm. So God was right. good to me. Projecting he made it you. where... I didn't have a gun. You know. I want to, we want to get into, of course, your conversion, your story of faith, but I don't want to go too fast there because I, I want to get a little bit more of a sense for these prison places, these communist prison facilities, if you can call them that. And uh, I, I, you don't have to share the gory details, but I want a little bit more about what it's like. We who were so protected, we never experienced anything like this, your okay. protection. Um, you were on the offensive. I mean, you were a pilot, you, 400 missions, bomber, pilots, and now you're on the defensive. Right. What, what was going on when you were first? Where did you go? What was it like? Were there various kinds of prison facilities or what? I was in six different camps. They varied pretty widely, but generally they always kept you solo or with one other person because what they regard you as a as a weapon to use in the propaganda war to help them win the war okay so right. a communist prison camp is totally completely different than anything anybody in america or even west europe could ever imagine even the germans never used it like this the communists are pure evil absolute evil you just can't imagine it like it took me two years to realize they simply couldn't tell the truth in the mm -hmm. interrogations mm -hmm. and it took me two years to understand why that they were addicted to lying mm -hmm. like we would be addicted to alcohol to mm -hmm. smoking mm -hmm. to something else okay mm -hmm. they were addicted to lying mm -hmm. when you're addicted to lying you can't tell the truth mm -hmm. in other words these aren't flowers this is a pine tree right yeah. this is the kind of thing they'd say it wouldn't mm -hmm. mean anything but you know mm -hmm. Besides that, we were kept solo and we were under constant interrogation and torture for military information and to meet delegations that were friendly to them from Europe and the United States. Mm -hmm. This made every day terror. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd wake up in the morning, I was on a boxing team and judo team. Right. Before you go in the ring, and I played football, mm -hmm. before you go into the fight, you have fear in your stomach, mm -hmm. okay? You don't ever show it, but yeah. there's fear in your right. stomach. It's common, all right? It was that kind of thing much, much worse because the second you woke up in the morning, mm -hmm. you were in a fight to avoid being a traitor. Mm -hmm. This was a fight to mm -hmm. avoid being a traitor yes. to the United States, yes. okay? Mm. So it was absolute terror every day. Like I used to tell people, every day was a month, <coughs> every month was a year, every mm. year was a lifetime. Yes. That's how slow the time went. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, conditions were bread and water twice a day. The bread had tremendous, you know, hundreds of rat droppings mm -hmm. in it as an example. The bread, mm -hmm. the water had hundreds and hundreds of worms in it, little worms that mm -hmm. you drink and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Twice a day you had terrible parasites after two or three years coming out all your openings and so on, okay? The conditions there, in the wintertime it was unbelievable cold, in the summertime it was unbelievable heat. I could go on and on and on and on and on. But the conditions are impossible to describe to Americans. It's impossible. You can't believe that you can live in conditions like that. Well, is there emotional terror, psychological terror, yeah. dehumanization, terror. I guess you couldn't communicate with the other people. I you, mean, those you, seems like terrible things yeah. as well as the you, you couldn't, you're not allowed to communicate. It's terrible torture when you're communicating. But we tapped through the walls. We had a tap code right. mm -hmm. and that was 25 letters. You know, and you didn't have any K, so you had 25 letters. So you had a five by five matrix. So you could tap the row column like I want to tap high. That's H. That's mm -hmm. second row, third column, second row, forward column. So I can tap. Okay, then the guy, you have to be on the wall, has to be very low so nobody can hear. The guy on the other side of the wall says, got it. If he doesn't get it, he goes, yeah. 
if, and then you retap. And he gets it. Next word, texting, yeah. one word at a time, abbreviations like yeah. crazy. We're on those walls six to eight hours a day. Half the guys are on the walls, half the guys are looking at the crack under the door. No windows, no radio, no heat, no cold in these little cells, okay? Mm -hmm. Half the guys are looking under the crack under the door to see when the guards are coming to any one of the cells okay. on the block. When, any, when the guards are coming, a guy on the floor goes like that, and you can hear that throughout the entire cell block. Everybody's off the wall. Mm -hmm. And back on as soon as the guard's away from the wall, because they're yeah. listening through the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just... <clears throat> as you share that, that I'm trying to place myself, you know, in, in your context. That brings me joy that I could communicate with somebody, you know, from my own right. country. Like, I mean, that, right. that sanity to some degree. Oh, it was, it was the only r reason that <laughs> any of us survived. Okay, mm -hmm. we fought as a team. We fought as a team. Mm -hmm. We fought under command. We did the code of conduct. You know, the guy in charge, data rank, was in charge. Whatever he said, we did. We constantly adjusted. We're constantly adjusting to their interrogations. They're constantly adjusting to our countermeasures. Mm -hmm. We beat them in North Vietnam. We beat them because of that communication, mm -hmm. because of the code of conduct. Only because of that. You're absolutely helpless physically, but you can, you can fight yeah. mm -hmm. mentally. Yeah. You know. Where do you think your mental strength came from? God. Only God. <laughs> Only. Where God. were you in the faith when you got shot down? Where were you in faith when you were there? In when person? I first, I was a cradle Catholic, but I just thought that God was in the distance. He worried about the big things. I knew I've been to parochial school for five years. To give you an idea of the lack of faith I had, when I first got shot down, I remember thinking in the first month under this, I remember thinking in my mind, I wasn't praying, I just said, I wonder if God's up here. Mm. I wonder if God's up here, mm. okay? And my answer to myself was sure and confident. No, you can't expect them to be here. It's too <laughs> filthy. It's too rotten. <laughs> it's pure evil. It's just horror. You can't expect God to be here. So my lack of faith was when things get tough, God checks out. Mm. In other words, I'm not going to be with you now in prison camp. Are you kidding me? Mm. Okay. Within a year, I knew that he was infinitely powerful. He was with me totally. Mm -hmm. And he completely controlled prison camp. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it looked like we were going to be up there the rest of our lives. But I knew after about a year, year and a half, and he saved me all kinds of times from torture and interrogations and treason and everything else. Okay, he did. God did. I knew that after that first year, year and a half, that if he wanted the war to end and us to go home the next day, it would. Mm -hmm. And if he wanted it, us to die up there, which is what it looked like, he would. But the most important thing I knew is in either case or anything in between, it was perfect for me, mm -hmm. for Sandy, mm -hmm. for the little kids, for everyone in the world. That's the confidence that he gave me. That's the conversion he gave me in a communist prison camp. Total, absolute demonstration of his mm -hmm. power mm -hmm. in prison camp from prayer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this, I mean, you're, a, you're an athlete, you're a tough guy, you're bright. Um, a little not so strong in faith before this happens, but you were broken. I mean, most of these guys had to be broken down to, I don't know why, but in the midst of that, you're being broken down so terribly, somehow what remained was God. I mean, that, yeah. a lot of guys were led to God right. because of this brokenness. Right. Well, you, 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 there's, you, when you're broken, what we called broken was where the guys were under the torture, they completely lost their minds. Yes. Okay. They're just... Staring, mm -hmm. couldn't talk to them or anything like that, and they just over a period yeah. of a year or two, they just died. Right. Okay, mm -hmm. that was it. Okay. okay, I never got to that point, but you know, basically, I had. Well, I used the wrong term then because I understand that broken. What What would you call what well, happened what, to you? What happened to me was yeah. just about as bad. I was almost driven to suicide by hatred. Mm -hmm. Now it was just like you guys. You know, you guys probably never hate anybody. Most Americans don't understand what real hate is. They beat my good friend to death mm -hmm. over a period of a month, you know, six feet away from me in a cell two removed. They beat him to death. I'd been with him three years at, three years at the Air Force Academy. They beat him to death when he was 65 pounds or so. Mm -hmm. now, I could pick him up like a baby. He'd been without food for 45 days. They beat him to death on his wounds, which were open wounds on his leg from bones through his leg, coming out his leg. Mm -hmm. Okay. They beat him to death like that. <coughs> hearing his screams. And of course, we screamed like crazy, but that never stopped him. They killed them like that. The interrogations and torture they did to us and everybody around us were just horrible, just 
horrible, horribly cruel. Okay, so I learned to hate. All right, mm. I'm supposed to forgive, you know. Jesus Christ is on the cross. He says, forgive him. Okay, he's getting worse torture than anything we ever got or anybody anybody's ever got. Okay, God, we have so to we're pause supposed right to forget. Pause right there. But we are carrying you over in the next segment. Okay, and so we're speaking with Captain Guy Gruders, Vietnam prisoner of war deep man of faith by God's grace and mercy. We'll be right back. Plenty more to come. Please don't go away. Thank you. Welcome back. Well, we are having an outstanding conversation with Captain Guy Gruders, who is our special guest today, and we are privileged and honored to have him with Amen. us. Well, before we went to break, you were talking about hate. Tell us about the hate. Well, the hate built up through the months to the mm -hmm. point where I started having voices talking to me mm -hmm. that the way to beat these guys was to commit suicide, mm -hmm. okay? The devil's are very smart. Yes. He knew I didn't want to be a traitor. So mm -hmm. he says the way you can really beat them is commit suicide. So just stop eating and so on. So these voices are telling me this kind of things in all kinds of different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why are these voices talking to me? I'm saying, why does this? Why, why is this is crazy? These things are, these are not my voices. Right. These are other voices, okay? Mm -hmm. So you ever see in a, in, a, in a newspaper where it says, I didn't do it. God told me to kill my wife or mm -hmm. my husband or my right. children. It's, Believe it's it. voices. Right. Believe mm -hmm. it. The voices mm -hmm. were there, but it wasn't God. Mm -hmm. You know. Right. So that's what I had is to commit suicide, mm -hmm. and so I said, "Oh, this is wrong." I knew that because luckily I had a good nun teach me. You know, when I was in parochial mm -hmm. school, suicide is wrong. It's mm -hmm. a mark of a coward, mm -hmm. a quitter, and worse than that, she'd say, "You know, you make your whole family the mm -hmm. quitter coward." The, mm. quit, the quitter family, the mm. coward family. So don't ever commit suicide. <laughs> Plus, you might go to hell. So mm -hmm. I knew I couldn't mm -hmm. commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there saying, well, why am I, why is that happening to me? That mm -hmm. means it's a bad guy. Yeah. Why is he talking to me? I'm trying to fight like a son of a gun, mm -hmm. doing the best I can. And then, I, then again, because my mother and aunt were going to daily mass and mm -hmm. communion, mm -hmm. I had the grace to be unblinded. Yes. I said, oh my gosh, it's hate. You know, Satan is hate. God is love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I realized I'm in hate. So I said, I said, and then I remember thinking, well, Lord, you don't mean that I have to forgive these people. That's impossible. That's mm -hmm. what I thought in my mind. Sure. And there was dead silence in my <laughs> mind. I realized, oh, my gosh, I got to <laughs> forgive them. So I knew that to go back to Sandy and the kids, you know, to give them a chance, it wouldn't be fair to leave her. Mm -hmm. So I said, it, the, the, with suicide, I said, so I said, to go back to her, I got to stop this hate. Okay, I'm going to stop this hate. I'm strong. I'm 25, mm -hmm. strong, I smart. will fight hate. Okay, I will fight hate. Okay. <laughs> Couldn't fight hate. Right. Lost. Completely lost. Mm. Okay. So I got on my knees and I said, Jesus, I need your help. Please help me, Jesus. If you're there, please help me. Please, please help me. So I prayed uh, hours a day. I didn't remember any of the mysteries of the rosary. I remembered that it was 150 Hail Marys with an hour father every <coughs> 10. That's what I did. I prayed that over and over again through the days. And after three months, I was ecstatic because in my mind, I said, Lord, it just in my mind, I couldn't say it out loud, mm -hmm. but in my mind I said, Lord, forgive them. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean it. It was a lie. Right. But just the fact I could form That's forgive right. them in my mind, right. I knew there was progress. So after three more months, I'm literally praying for them. I said, I know they're your kids, Lord. I know you want every one of them in heaven. I'm praying for every one of them to go to heaven, okay? Yeah. And I mean it, and he knew I meant it, and mm -hmm. I had the greatest joy and peace in my heart for those mm -hmm. last three and a half years in prison camp mm -hmm. that I've ever had in my life because I was constantly praying for my enemies, yes. honest. And as a result of that, I lived. That's if I hadn't, I wouldn't have lived. Right. Okay? Well, you know, you, what you said, um, so unbelievable because the devil, all he wanted you was dead. Right. I mean, and you were fighting death. He didn't care how, whether you committed suicide or they tortured you. He just wanted you dead. Right. He, that's all he has. He's yeah. the father of lies. He's living in these people who are God forsaken, but yet God loves them. You right. know, and then you get to see that. And you know the only way that happened 
was because somebody was praying. Okay. Because that was a miracle to behold. It was a miracle to understand the right. problem. Right. We want to continue right. speaking about the greatness of God working in your life on Friday. Guy Grudis will be back with us on Friday. You're not going to want to miss it. Keep it on EWTN. You're an important part of this family. You're always at home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.